everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am happy to uh, be able to host with the Wayne Environmental Commission this program about the spotted lantern fly in New Jersey and um, so that we can learn about this invasive and uh, dangerous insect and, and learn how to identify and eradicate it. I'm going to just start by um, introducing myself. I'm Patty Slezak. I'm one of the reference librarians at Wayne Public Library. And I'm going to introduce Katie Scheidt, um, who is a Wayne Township resident. And she's lived in Wayne with her family since 2007 and currently serves on the Wayne Environmental Commission. Welcome, Katie. Hi, thank you so much. I want to just quickly thank you, Patty, very much, and Amy Rowe, thank you very much and everyone at Wayne Public Library for offering these programs. Um, they have very rich and, and diverse content for everyone of all ages. And I think it's a wonderful organization over at the library. So thank you very much. Um, we also put this together on short notice. So extra kudos to Patty. <laughs> thank you. Um, we've recently seen, uh, we've had some public um, reporting to the Environmental Commission of instances of sightings of spotted lanternflies. So that is what sparked this conversation and this program. Um, I, as Patty mentioned, I serve on the Wayne Environmental Commission. You can find, we have a web page on the township website. Our meetings are open to the public. Um, right now they're currently still being held online, but if anybody has any questions, um, you are what, more than welcome to come. We have an open public portion for every meeting for comments and concerns for our citizens. Um, we wanted to, one of the reasons we wanna do programs like this is to reach out to the public and create public awareness and education opportunities for people in our community. And let us know that we exist because some people are aware of that and some people are not. Um, invasive plants and animals are becoming an increasingly difficult challenge to our natural environment. Um, it's exacerbated by issues like climate change. Uh, one such invasive species is what we're going to talk about today, which is the spotted lanternfly, which originally came from China in 2014 to Pennsylvania and has been spreading throughout New Jersey for the past several wow. years. I'll let Amy take more, <laughs> take the rest of the information about that. Um, we have, I just wanted to say quickly, um, we want to start the conversation with the public. So if you have any questions about anything here, you can reach out to Patty or feel free to reach out to me. I have a Wayne Township email address, which is my last name, S-C-H-E-I-D-T-K at waynetownship.com. Feel free to reach out to me, or there is also a web form to reach out to the commission and all of the commission commissioners get an email when you submit uh, a concern. So I want to introduce Amy Rowe. Uh, she's with Rutgers, Extension, Rutgers Cooperative Extension as an agriculture, I have to read the title because it's a long title, <laughs> an agriculture and natural resources county agent for Essex and Passaic counties. Uh, recently, she's focused on helping New Jersey residents reduce the impact of pests such as ticks and our discussion topic today spotted lanternfly. So thank you, Amy, for joining us. Uh, so real quickly, I just want to talk about Rutgers Cooperative Extension. If you guys are not aware of what we do, we are the education and outreach arm of the university. So we are bringing the research from main campus out into the local level. So there is a county extension office in every county in New Jersey. And I'm here representing both Essex and Passaic, but my, my office is in Wayne. Um, and we are here for you. We provide all kinds of educational opportunities. So we have a 4-H youth development department. We have a nutrition and family community services department. And then we have an agriculture and horticulture department as well as my department, which is natural resources. So if you have any needs or questions and you need resources, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to Extension. And my contact info will be at the end of this presentation. So I uh, just wanted to give that background because a lot of people don't know that Extension exists and we're a great resource in the county. So thank you for letting me talk about that for a minute. So now let's talk about everyone's pest of the hour. So we have the spotted lanternfly 
which is neither a lantern nor a fly, as a young child uh, decided to tell me a couple weeks ago. Uh, so yes, these are not uh, glowing or uh, lightning bugs. They do not have a lantern. I don't know why they're called lantern fly in terms of the lantern part. I have looked for several weeks trying to understand the, the naming of this particular creature, uh, but this is a plant hopping insect. It does have wings. It can fly, but it is mostly jumping. Uh, when it is an adult, it is very strong jumper. Uh, if you've ever tried to, to kill one, you may have been too slow because they are really fast. Um, but they are native to China, as Katie had said. They are invasive across the rest of Asia. And so it's not just the US dealing with this problem. This is, this is all over uh, Asia. But we have been hit with this. And I'll get to, to the invasion into the US in a minute. Uh, but these these little critters are very striking. Um, they are, some people tell me they're too beautiful to kill. And unfortunately, please overcome this bias and please kill them. Uh, we'll be going over some management issues, um, but I just want you to take a look at this. So this is the adult form here on this picture. I'm very embarrassed to say that the picture on the left is a spotted lanternfly taunting me right outside my office. I took this picture just a couple days ago. Um, it was just staring at me and it was perfect for this talk, but it is very depressing that despite my uh, my adventures trying to kill as many as possible, this one was, was looking at me right through the window. Um, but you can see it does have spots. Um, they, the adults are about one to two inches long uh, they're also very distinctive. Um, so you can see on the right that when their wings are completely open, they have a very distinct red um, coloring on the bottom of their wings. It's very noticeable. Um, this is part of the reason that a lot of people think that they are moths because when their wings are spread, they look kind of like a moth, um, but again, it is mostly, they mostly travel through jumping. They can fly, but it expand, it expends a lot of energy. So, so if one hops away from you, it is unlikely to hop away from you again. So you can stomp it on the second try uh, because they're not good at, at multiple jumping. Uh, so keep that in your in your arsenal when you're when you're trying to kill them. Uh, but you can see that the the abdomen, the bottom of the torso is very distinct as well. It's a yellow color and the females uh, have a very large or swollen abdomen compared to the males, especially right now in the fall during their, their laying, their egg laying season. Uh, so go ahead and, and look for those, those swollen ones to kill uh, as, as many as possible because we are in egg laying season. I will get, get into that. Uh, but I just wanted you to see the adult form, which is what you will be seeing in the fall. We'll discuss the, the other life cycle stages, but these are what is out and about right now. You will not see young ones. You will not see uh, the, the nymphs. These are, these are the life stage we're in right now. So basically the message here is kill all of them, but if you have to choose for some reason, go for the ones with the biggest abdomens because those are the females and they are about to lay eggs right now. It is, this is the most timely webinar ever because it is, it is now, we are, we are right in the egg laying season. And so I will get to get to that in a little bit. So let's just, I just wanted to show you uh, their adult form right now, but we will get into all of this. So. The problem with these insects, so they are not harmful to people or animals, so they're not going to bite you. They're, they may scare you if they land on you because they, they're they actually kind of friendly uh, to a degree. They, they've landed on me by accident. Um, and so, so they will not bite. They uh, attack plants. So they feed on hardwood trees, they feed on vines, they feed on agricultural crops, and this is the main threat that they are posing. So they are able to stick their mouth part, which is kind of like a straw, 
right through bark of, of hardwood trees and they can suck out the sap. They are literally sap suckers. Um, and so eventually this can, this can damage trees. Um, it usually does not lead to <coughs> the death of the tree from the feeding, but it's the aftermath uh, that can lead to um, detrimental effects of the trees. So when the, when the insects suck out this, this sap, the insect itself excretes what's called honeydew, which is a very sticky substance so it's kind of like a waste product that's very sugary. And so then the spotted lanternfly goes away, starts to feed on the next tree, but that sticky honeydew attracts other insects. So wasps, hornets, anything that likes sugar. So then you have all these other insects that are annoying and this sticky sugary substance can also attract fungus and mold and this black sooty mold that can lead to health problems on these, on these trees. And so again, it is unlikely that your tree will die from spotted lanternfly feeding, but they are this nuisance, um, you know, in, in the typical homeowner um, experience, but our agricultural crops are in danger, especially in South Jersey, we have lots of wineries and grapes are a, a favorite of this creature. And so uh, again, I will get to this a little bit later, but just be aware that hardly any homeowner's oak tree died from, from spotted lanternfly, but it's just detrimental to the health and can lead to, um, lead to health issues down the line for, for some of our major trees. Uh, and again, not harmful to people or animals. These insects are just pests. Okay, so, so as Katie said, uh, we have had the spotted lanternfly in the U.S. since 2014. They were first found in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. Uh, they have since made their way into multiple states, not just New Jersey, although they were confirmed in New Jersey in 2018. We have now seen confirmed sightings of spotted lanternfly in every county across the state except Cape May County. Um, and according to our Rutgers Entomology Department Chair, George Hamilton, uh, no one really understands why they're not in Cape May. Um, we don't know, it, it may just be a matter of time. Um, but for now, there are confirmed sightings in, in every county except Cape May and 13 of our counties are in quarantine at the moment. So quarantine is just meaning that the movement of certain materials needs a permit in order to be allowed because these critters are hitchhikers. They uh, move about, like I said, they cannot really fly very far. And so the main ways that they are moving is hitchhiking on vehicles, uh, they are hitchhiking on like landscaping and yard waste. They are um, being moved by in terms of lumber, those kinds of things. And so when I say that counties are in quarantine, it's not like COVID quarantine where you can't leave your house or anything like that. It's just that if you are a business owner, you need a permit to move certain materials across state lines. So just be aware of that. I'll provide some, some resources for you. Um, if you have more questions about quarantine, but Passaic County, if you guys are in Passaic, which I'm assuming you are, if you're listening to this Wayne Library webinar, uh, Passaic County is not in the quarantine. So if you see spotted lanternfly, you should still be reporting it to the State Department of Agriculture. So I have the, the link to do that. Uh, it's just a quick, you know, your name, your location, how many bugs you saw, that kind of thing so that the state can still get an idea of, of where the infestations are. Again, unfortunately, we, we've been a little overrun by this insect. And so we're, it's not as, as critical as it was because we're, we're seeing them everywhere, but the state does wanna know, especially because Passaic County is not in quarantine and they still need to see, to know where those sightings are happening. So please, Please report that. I'll give you the, the, um, the website at the end of this presentation. 
Uh, are there any questions? Did you guys want to chat? Should we move on? Good. Good. Amy, um, I had a confirmed Cape May sighting. Hate to tell you that. You did. Okay. Um, did you report it? I did not, I had um, one of our, I posted the flyer for this on social media. So I had a Wayne resident who was in Cape May who had a confirmed sighting. I'll go oh. back and look at the history and ask her to submit it if she hasn't okay. already. That would be great because um, like I said, I just spoke with our entomology department chair, George Hamilton, and he said that they had not confirmed it in Cape May. So that's, that's important. So please, thank you. That would be great. Um, okay. So, all right. So we talked a little bit about the overview of spotted lanternfly, and now I want to get into, into some of the nitty gritty. Uh, so this insect has several life cycle stages, just like most insects. Um, and so, so let's start at the top here. We have the egg laying that's going to be happening right now. Uh, so the eggs are usually this, <clears throat> excuse me, this kind of muddy looking mass on tree bark. Uh, they are usually laid fairly high up in the air, like 20 to 30 feet. So you may not notice that you have spotted lanternfly egg masses, but uh, really no outdoor surface is safe. These creatures will lay eggs on, on anything. Um, maybe your vehicle, maybe your trash can, maybe your outdoor furniture. So keep an eye out, please um, check for these, you know, anything, anything that's not actively moving, they, they could lay eggs on. So when these are the overwintering habit, uh, the adults do not survive the winter. So the egg masses are the only way that this species is being perpetuated through, through those cold months. So in the spring, very late spring and early summer, the eggs will start to hatch. So May into June. And the, the insect that is first coming out of those eggs is this pretty distinct black and white polka dotted little guy. Um, so there are three nymphal stages that are black and white. And so basically the itty bitty little one is hatching, then it grows up a little bit and it it explodes out of its, its carapace into the next version. So these these nymphal stages are called instars, if you've never heard that term. It's just the, the name for a larger and larger version of the same life stage for an insect. So the first instar is very teeny tiny. They are black and white. Then you have a slightly bigger one, um, and it's also black and white. Then you have your third stage of this little guy, also black and white. And this is going throughout the summer. So in May into June, they're hatching. June and July, you've got the second round. Later June and July, you have the third round. They're growing as the, as the season goes on. Then their final nymphal stage is called, is the fourth instar. They are even more striking with this red and black and white polka dotted um, body. They are very distinct. They're very easy to see. Um, at this stage of development, they are very easy to, to spot and to, and to kill, uh, to kill manually. Uh, they, they are everywhere in your garden. You may have noticed them already uh, in the past season. Again, we are not seeing them right now. It is adult time uh, right now, so you shouldn't be seeing them. But again, this insect is very distinct. This doesn't look like anything else in your in your yard or in your garden and they are they are invasive there is no natural predator there are predators that may eat them like praying mantises or um, spiders but all of those are are general predators they will eat just about anything there's no preferred there's no uh, predator that prefers, uh, spotted lanternfly. So we, we need to do our part because nature is not doing, uh, doing anything here. So then in the fourth instar, you have your, your black and red and white one that will finally um, 
emerge into into the adult version that that we've been talking about. So again, this is a very interesting looking insect. You have the spots, you have the kind of lavender gray color, and then the red underneath when they are flying or, or when they are, um, you know, just kind of hanging out. Sometimes they they put their wings out, and the adults are going to be out and about all the way until December. So this is, you know, it's fall, we're seeing them right now, but we are going to continue to see them. They will be mating, they will be moving because they need to find a mate. And then they will, the females will be laying those eggs. So then we're, we're back to our full circle, egg mass laying. And then it's all over again, started starting in the spring when they start to hatch. And so this is, this is very typical to all kinds of different insects life cycles. There's nothing unusual here, except the, the difference in the, the form of the nymphal stage. A lot of insects have a nymph stage that is the same. They don't change colors or anything like that. So this is, it's a little unique that way. Um, but yeah, these, these guys are, are really interesting and they, they really are a striking looking insect. And again, several people that I've talked to say they're too pretty or too beautiful to kill. And please don't, don't listen to that. Please, please kill them. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about their ecology. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. I'm go ahead. sorry. I just wanted to um, ask what's the best way to uh, destroy the egg sacs? This brings back to memory when I was younger, when the gypsy moths attacked this area and in grade school, they had us scraping the trees and burning, burning them actually. And it was really quite dramatic. So I was wondering what's the best way to collect and um, destroy these egg sacs? Yeah, so I'm actually going to get to that. So if you could just give me a couple slides. Um, I want to, to talk about the egg masses themselves uh, so that people know how to identify them. Um, but yeah, that, that's a great segue and I, I will get there, um, but just wanted you to know that each female can lay two masses per season uh, during this, during the fall, and they can lay all the way through December. So don't let your guard down. Don't think, oh, well, you know, we got through October or November, like they can still lay and you know, maybe, maybe they're saving up. Maybe they didn't lay twice early in the fall and they're, they're going to wait till December. So be on the lookout, be vigilant. Again, most often they are laying on the bark of trees, but 90% of egg masses are found 30 feet above the ground. So this is not necessarily something that the general population will be able to, to manage. Um, but like I said, they will lay on anything that's not moving. So uh, keep an eye out. Again, look for those hard plastic things like garbage bins, recycling bins. I've had a lot of people send me pictures of egg masses on their patio furniture. Um, so just, just keep an eye out, even though 90% are 30 feet above the ground. Um, that still leaves 10% that is within reach. And I will get to how to manage those egg masses uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, but yeah, you can see here in this picture, this is, they lay the eggs and then they cover them with this kind of muddy looking liquid that actually, when it's first laid, it's very smooth. So this is the smooth version. And then as we get closer to spring, it actually starts to crack so that the eggs can get out and the, you know, not the eggs, the, the larvae can come out and actually hatch and, and be nymphs. Um, and so, so this is a brand new egg mass. And then the, the ones in the spring usually look like, like cracked mud or dry mud compared to this, this smooth looking one. So just keep that in mind. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have a picture of the, the cracked mud version, but you can, you can imagine what that looks like. So what else do we need to know about spotted lanternfly? So unfortunately, its life cycle is tied to another invasive species in in the US and it is called tree of heaven. So this is a tree that is also native to China and it is 
everywhere. You may have seen it along highways. It tends to be an edge species. You won't find it generally deep in the woods. It's usually on the edge of the woods or on a border uh, along highways, uh, some place where it doesn't have, it's not competing with established um, trees and trees that are supposed to be there. Now, the reason that the tree of heaven made its way to the US, they actually were prizing it for a landscape plant. Um, this sounds crazy now, but back in the, the late 1700s, someone brought it here because this tree grows very quickly and it can provide shade um, fairly soon after planting. Like it grows very quickly and can provide shade because it has a lot of leaves. And I'll show you, I'll show you the leaves in a minute. You can see them here, but I'll go through the, the biology of them. So, so what's the connection to Tree of Heaven? Well, spotted lanternfly and Tree of Heaven are, are like a a biological relationship that benefits both of them. Uh, they are mutually benefited by being near each other. Uh, tree of Heaven is the preferred host tree for spotted lanternfly at all stages of its life cycle. So this is where, I'm um, sorry, I have, I have a couple of artifacts from my last slide here, uh, but this is the preferred host. They uh, spotted lanternfly will will lay eggs on all kinds of things, as I said. Um, but they they prefer tree of heaven. They prefer to eat tree of heaven, um, but they are not picky about what they're eating, and they they will actually feed on more than seventy species of of hardwood trees and vines and all kinds of other things. And again, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but there is research being done right now trying to figure out if tree of heaven is absolutely necessary for spotted lanternflies life cycle, or if it's just a strong preference. Uh, we don't know at this point, but there are lots of researchers looking into this. Uh, University of Delaware has been looking into this. Uh, Cornell has been doing research on this, Penn State also. And so, so we don't know yet, but it seems that way that tree of heaven is necessary for, for spotted lanternfly, but we're not 100% sure. So this is going to be important when we do management of spotted lanternfly, which is probably the topic you guys all want to get to. Um, so if you are trying to identify tree of heaven in your landscape, be aware that the, the leaves are compound, which means that there are a lot of little leaflets on each leaf. So this, I don't know if you can see this, this is one leaf that has all these little leaflets that, that look like a single leaf, but these are probably between 18 and 24 inches long. So all of that is considered one leaf and then all of these small ones are considered leaflets. And the, the difference between this tree and sumac, which is native to New Jersey, is that the, the leaf edge is smooth, where the sumac tree has little razor-like razor, razor -like teeth uh, along the, the leaf edges. So that's one way to tell whether you have sumac or, or tree of heaven. Uh, also, the seeds for Tree of Heaven grow in clusters, uh, kind of they're winged, kind of like, like your maple little helicopters, um, but they, they grow in these, these little clusters. They're called Samaras, if you've ever heard that term. And so, so this is another way to know that you have Tree of Heaven rather than sumac. Uh, sumac grows these very um, robust maroon, um, flowers uh, where um, Tree of Heaven has more like yellowish um, dainty flowers. Um, so we can, if you have questions about identification, please contact your extension office for sure. Um, but yeah, the, this Tree of Heaven is, it's usually fairly slim in terms of its bark. I mean, it's, it's trunk. It, it grows very straight. Um, 
And again, it, it prefers that edge. So it could be along the edge of a parking lot. It could be along the edge of the forest. It could be near all kinds of landscaping areas where you have disturbance. Um, they also grow, let's see, I think I have another slide here. Nope, we'll get to that. We'll get to management of Tree of Heaven in a minute. Uh, but the other problematic thing about Tree of Heaven is that it is very prolific. It can grow from seed, but it can also grow from uh, seedlings that grow from the bottom of, of the trunk of the tree itself. They're called suckers. You may have, have heard that term. And so even if you cut down the actual main tree, the tree of heaven will pop right back up from all these little suckers that will grow off the main stump. And so this makes it extremely difficult to remove. And unfortunately, removal is a really effective way to, to combat spotted lanternfly. And so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, this, these invasive species are, are very persistent and they're hard to, hard to manage. And that's why they're so success, successful uh, in the environment. So let's talk about other plants that spotted lanternfly will will feed on and will um, damage. So like I said, they're found on more than 70 different host plants. So it's not just tree of heaven, although that is the preferred host. And so unfortunately, like I said, for New Jersey, grapevines are very attractive to tree, uh, to spotted lanternfly. So we, we are seeing some damage in South Jersey where all of our wineries are, um, especially because South Jersey was the first to see spotted lanternfly coming over from Pennsylvania. And so we have seen a little bit of crop loss and damage uh, to grapes. Uh, in New Jersey, that's the only crop that we have seen true loss from. Um, in Pennsylvania, since the spotted lanternfly is a lot more um, established there, they're seeing losses of all kinds of crops. But right now in New Jersey, we're just seeing the, the crop loss of grapes and grape vines. But again, these guys will go after fruit bearing trees, things like apples and peaches, anything, uh, pears, anything that, that grows on a tree. Vine crops, so not just grapes, but hops. Uh, are also in danger, although again, we haven't seen that so far in New Jersey. They also like typical hardwood trees that people have in their landscape. So maples, oaks, walnuts, willows. And then they even like roses, again, because those are often growing as, as vine varieties. Um, and they don't just like cultured roses, they also like our, uh, our invasive roses like Multiflora rose, um, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, these guys will, will feed on just about anything. They're not picky. The only thing that they have not been seen to feed on are conifers. So our, our pine trees, our um, fir, spruce, any of those guys, we have not seen them uh, feeding hardly at all. Um, so not sure if they don't like the really thick sap that those kinds of trees have. Um, I haven't seen why they're not going after those types of trees, but for now we'll, we'll take it as a small favor. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. So let's talk about the egg mass scraping. Uh, so what you're going to do to remove these egg masses is you're going to take some kind of hard plastic. <laughs> some people recommend a credit card, but I don't think you should use your credit card to, to scrape eggs off of a tree uh, unless it's an expired credit card. You want to be able to use it later. Um, but any kind of hard plastic or like a putty knife, something that will not harm the tree and really get into the bark, um, scrape that thing off. And then you can either double bag it in Ziploc. So put it in a bag, zip it up, put it in another bag, zip it up and throw it in the trash. Please don't, you know, leave it in your house. You know, don't think, oh, it'll be fine. You don't want baby lantern fly nymphs all over your house if you accidentally didn't uh, zip that up. So make sure you dispose of it. 
Or you can take that, that egg mask that you scraped off, put it in a bag and pour rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer in the bag. Just let it sit for a little bit and then throw that whole thing away also. So those are the, the recommendations. Um, I've never heard anyone say to set them on fire. Patty, as you were saying, the gypsy moth um, egg masses were, were taught way back when. Um, but I'm sure that if you scraped it off and set it on fire, it would dispose of those eggs. Those eggs would not be viable, but I don't feel like that's a safe option. So um, let's and let's not let's not be that dramatic. We'll we'll just put them into into alcohol or double bag, which seems uh, seems a lot more reasonable. Um, but yeah, this is this is very simple. Um, just double bagging so that they're suffocating or or that rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer is really really straightforward. Um, so that's one way you know, a couple ways to get rid of the egg masses. So that's one way of managing the spotted lanternfly is to, to scrape as many egg masses as possible. Again, this is difficult because a lot of times they are very high up in the air and you won't even notice them. You won't be able to get to them, uh, but anything that you can reach, please go ahead and scrape it. Um, so another way that people manage spotted lanternfly when you have actual insects and not just the eggs is called tree banding. So this is when you have a piece of sticky tape that you wrap around a tree trunk where you see the nymphs or you see the adults and you just tape that to the trunk. And then you have to make sure that you cover that with some kind of wire so that you're not catching birds or our beneficial insects like praying mantises or, um, you know, all of our, our helper insects. And unfortunately, because if you have an infestation, you may catch a lot of these guys. You're, you might have to replace the tape fairly often. And let me just show you a picture of this. So here on the left, we have tree banding technique. So you have this sticky tape uh, you can see it's caught all kinds of things, not only spotted lanternfly. So unfortunately, you've got some gnats, you've got ladybugs. Um, so this is a risk reward type of situation. Are you willing to, to catch some of our, our helper insects to, to manage these spotted lanternfly? It's a decision that you have to make for, for your property and what's best for you. Uh, and then the other way of dealing with spotted lanternfly is to trap them. So the circle traps are a interesting way of, of dealing with spotted lanternfly and its habits. So we know that they like to hang out on trees and we know that they like to climb up uh, rather than down. And so the circle trap it's a piece of screen, it's a couple pieces of wood, and then it is uh, the top of a milk jug, a gallon milk jug, so they have an, an opening, you know, a structurally sound opening into a plastic bag. And so the, the spotted lantern flies will climb up, they will get into the bag, and then they're too dumb to figure out how to get out uh, once, once they're in there. Uh, so this is something that you can purchase or you can make your own. I have uh, some resources available for you to show you how Penn State recommends making your own. Uh, again, they are several years ahead of us. So we, we just recommend all of the things that they are doing. So take a look at a possible circle trap. Now we do recommend that you use something disposable like this Ziploc bag um, so that you can just take it off and throw the hundreds of spotted lanternfly that you have in there, just throw it in the trash. Um, previous versions of the circle trap had something a little more permanent that needed to be emptied and then reattached and it just got messy. So they've been improving their, their circle trap as they have um, continued to do research and to figure out the best way to, to um, what's the word? What's the word when you make something better and better, um, improve uh, their circle trap as they've been going through years. So, so 
up. And again, Penn State has so many resources and I have that website for you guys in a bit. So the next question is how do we deal with tree of heaven? Uh, so this is a very stubborn tree. Um, so you can cut down the main tree itself. And then in order to manage those suckers that are gonna pop up, they recommend applying herbicide to, to the stump. And the, the chemicals are called dicamba or glyphosate. Uh, we cannot recommend name brands, but you can look those up. Uh, so any, um, any herbicide that you'll find in a box store that has these two ingredients are, you know, is appropriate for, for tree of heaven. And as an environmental person, I don't like to recommend chemical um, management of these types of things, but I know that there are people out there that, that do. And so these are the, the recommendations. Um, then you're going to remove any seedlings that may pop up like in your yard, because again, these can uh, grow from seed. So if you have seedlings that have actually grown in your yard, please remove those before they get established. Um, and then in heaven itself, don't allow it to establish. Like if you see it in your yard and it's just a couple inches, please remove it. Um, cut down anything you see and then deal with, deal with the stump. Uh, you really want to remove it before it establishes its main tap root. It's kind of like a really long carrot, has this very long, hardy tap root that even if you get it all up, again, you have, you have seeds, you have uh, the suckers uh, that may not have popped up. Uh, and so it, it's very difficult to remove once it is established. And this is a picture of the, the flowers along with the, the seedlings, those, um, those winged seeds. And so this tree actually has a male and a female um, version. Uh, and so the, the male version also has flowers, but the female version has flowers that are much more showy. And in order for the seeds to grow, it needs to be pollinated by the male uh, by the male flowers. So you need a pollinator to go from the male to the female in order to have these seedlings establish and um, for this tree to reproduce in that sexual way. Again, it does reproduce asexually with these suckers. So it is uh, stubborn, but a lot of researchers are doing some studies trying to figure out if you remove all of the female tree of heaven, will that stop tree of heaven from, from being a, a host plant for spotted lanternfly? Do they like the male version versus the female? There's a lot of research going on around the biology of tree of heaven itself in terms of the, the spotted lanternfly. So there's, there's a lot going on here. It's a very complicated relationship uh, so please remove tree of heaven if you can, but it is stubborn and it's not easy. So don't give up and really let your extension office know if, if you need help or if you're having issues, we'd love to, to help you with this. Okay, so bottom line, and you're not going to believe this, but the state of New Jersey has an actual campaign called Stomp It Out stomp out spotted lanternfly. So this is your green light to kill as many spotted lanternfly as possible. Like the state of New Jersey wants you to kill these things. Um, so when you are manually killing them, like I said, they may hop away from you, but they won't have enough energy to hop twice. So you can try to stomp them or you can flick them and wherever they land, go over there and stomp them then. And they're usually be prone and won't be able to move. And that's your, your second chance uh, to, to get them. Kill as many as possible. Kill everyone you see. Um, they are, are taking over 
New Jersey, like I said, I've had so many people tell me how many they've seen, how many they have all over their trees, how, you know, how they've seen them everywhere. Uh, so please, if you can, kill as many as possible, set up a trap. That'll make them real easy. Um, scrape those egg masses if you see them and then remove tree of heaven if you can. That would be a long time. All right, we're doing good. Uh, so remove tree of heaven if you can, but this is actually the official strategy from the state. Go ahead and stomp all those spotted lantern flies because this is, this is not just me telling you, this is the actual state strategy for dealing with this at the homeowner level. Um, so don't be shy, kill them all, don't feel bad. Uh, we want you to. <laughs> so here are some resources for you. Uh, so I had mentioned earlier some counties that had been uh, part of the quarantine. So um, five more counties have been added. And again, Passaic is still not part of the quarantine. So please go ahead and report them. This is the website that you will go to to report your spotted lanternfly sightings in Passaic County or Cape May if you're down there. Uh, so this is New Jersey Department of Agriculture. This, um, this is not going to be clickable for you if I send the slides out, but I will send a separate email with the clickable links um, so you don't have to write all this down. Then, like I said, Penn State has amazing resources. They've been dealing with this critter almost five years, five years longer than New Jersey. And so they have a lot of videos. They have step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for building those circle traps. They have all kinds of things. Uh, and then our own George Hamilton gave a webinar about this exact topic just a couple of weeks ago for Rutgers Earth Day Everyday program. And so the recording link from an actual entomologist, again, I'm sorry, I'm not an entomologist, uh, is here uh, on our YouTube channel. And so you can check that out if you need more, more details on the, the ecology and biology of this uh, insect uh, from an expert. And then if you guys need me, here is my location and my info. This is a praying mantis that I saw at my house eating a spotted lanternfly. Uh, so so everybody's doing their part to, to kill spotted lantern flies. And uh, yeah, so I'm here for you guys. And if you have any questions, don't be shy. Please give me a call or shoot me an email. And I'd love to, to help you deal with this pest. I have actually a few questions um, myself that I was hoping you could answer. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that they can the eggs can be laid on really any surface, so it doesn't matter if it's a hard surface or if it's a smooth surface, they can still attach their egg sacs to something that's smooth like a trash can or, or a side of a, a patio furniture? Yeah, so so they really can. It Whatever they're using to stick those eggs to, to tree bark is also stickable to those smooth surfaces. Um, so I've had several people send me pictures of this. Um, so I've seen it, you know, not in person, but people have been sending me their evidence of this. And yeah, it's true. They, they can lay on just about anything. Whatever sticky substance they're producing is, is sticking to even those very smooth things that you wouldn't think that it would stick to. Um, but, but there you go. And again, this is part of the reason that that these quarantines are important so that we're not transporting the egg masses on things that, that you wouldn't expect, like, you know, like even your car, your car itself, which is fairly smooth. Um, they've found a lot of hitchhiking uh, egg masses that way, like in the wheel well of your car, um, you know, under any overhang, like they'll sometimes be under the bumper. So even check your car uh, before you're crossing state lines, um, if your car is housed outdoors, uh, especially this time of year when they, when they are laying those egg nests. Mm. I had another question too. I'm sorry, Katie. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the, what can a homeowner do to possibly protect their uh, plants or, or shrubs 
Um, I'm particularly upset about the uh, vineyards being attacked. I had brought in the executive director of the Garden State Wine Growers Association. We did a Zoom meeting earlier this year. And uh, in fact, they, New Jersey has a new varietal that only New Jersey has. And it was starting to be propagated. And it really upsets me to, to know that it's in danger. So could they, could the vineyards or could homeowners for say rose bushes use a netting to kind of surround their trees or, or vines to protect against this? Yeah, so, so they're certainly screening uh, could, could possibly be one way to protect something, especially something valuable uh, like your prize roses or the new um, grape variety. Um, but really, you would need to keep on top of it and make sure that there aren't any holes and make sure that the, the screening is small enough to keep even the nymphs out, which are much smaller. Um, they are they are able to get through all kinds of things. And that's another reason why they're tricky uh, to deal with. And, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult. And unfortunately, like I said before, a lot of the agricultural, a lot of people in the agricultural community are turning to these chemical options just because they don't want to, to lose their financial investment and, you know, have this, have this damage um, into something that, that is so valuable. Um, you know, our, our wineries in New Jersey are, are really starting to, to be a, a top producer in terms of, of money brought in. And um, New Jersey is getting a little bit of a reputation for, for being a good place to, to grow wine grapes. And uh, so, so we do need to be careful, but a lot of agricultural folks would like to go to the chemical method. And, you know, there's a fine line between you know, pest management and being environmentally sustainable. And it's, it's difficult to make everyone happy. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, there are lots of farmers that do, um, do operate organically that are certified organic and are not allowed to, to use these chemicals. And there are some organic uh, pesticides that, that could work. Uh, but the other problem with the chemical method is that these chemicals are non-discriminate. They are going to kill beneficial insects. They're going to kill our honeybees. They're going to kill all kinds of things that weren't meant to be killed as part of the spotted lanternfly treatment. And so there really is a lot of research around biological control for this insect. Um, the like I had mentioned earlier, University of Delaware was looking at Tree of Heaven. They're also looking at a biological control that is using a wasp that is native to China that is a predator of the spotted lanternfly in China. Um, but that opens a whole nother uh, question. Is this wasp going to be invasive next? Um, and so they are currently in trials with that wasp but there are other controls that are being looked at in terms of biology. There are some fungi, some fungal studies that are underway to, to see if the spotted lanternfly can be stopped because um, there, there are aggressive um, funguses that can uh, inhibit the proliferation of spotted lanternfly. But again, it is coming from, from Asia and we need to be careful about what we release here and so it, it really is a, a fine line and trying to find the balance between the, the economic impacts and the environmental impacts. And, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're not gonna make everybody happy. Um, certainly not, not yet. Maybe the, the golden goose is, is out there and researchers will find it. Um, but this is, this is a story that's told time and time again um, with, with all kinds of, of conflicts between that economic 
piece and the the environmental piece and um, trying to hit the the bottom the triple bottom line is what they call it of being economically beneficial being environmentally sustainable and then being socially equitable um, you know there's there's a lot of things to consider and and that's kind of where we're at right now. We're, we're in the exploratory stage of, well, what's going to work? What's going to be a long-term issue? What can help in the short term? Uh, so, yeah. So, unfortunately, we're, we're kind of in limbo at the moment. I, I, want, I just wanted to make a comment, Amy. Um, I reached out to our Parks and Rec Department. They are aware of the problem and, of course, following all the state recommendations. Um, Laurel, we have an Arboretum in town, Laurelwood Arboretum. I'm sure you're familiar. Yep, I am. Um, we reached out to them also and they volunteer, their arborist volunteered that they are setting bait trees. Um, I guess they're using the tree of heaven as bait yep. trees for this pest. And I thought I had never heard of that before. And I thought that was such a clever strategy. Um, is that something I know we're talking about the homeowner level, but um, it seems like such a such an interesting um, defense against this pest is to use an invasive species against another invasive species. And I wonder if that's done with other, we could probably have a whole series just on invasive species in New Jersey. We, we could, I mean, There's there are, there, there are animals, there are plants, there are insects, there are fungi, there are all kinds of things. We, we really could spend, you know, hours and hours on invasive species but, but yeah, this, this idea of the, the trap um, or bait plant, like having that, the male version of tree of heaven. So again, you don't have the female producing the seeds. Um, that is a concept that I've seen um, for, for this type of, of infestation, this spotted lanternfly. I haven't heard of it for other Invasives, I, again, this is not necessarily my area of expertise as I'm not an entomologist, um, but, but yeah, it is very clever and it, it is interesting to consider, like, you know, I, I have a fairly large property. I was telling Patty, we have a small farm in Warren County. And so, so we've been removing tree of heaven but I've also considered leaving one or two that are reachable in terms of removing egg masses, uh, putting traps on, and you know, attracting the, the spotted lanternfly to this one thing so that it leaves everything else alone. Like we have fruit trees, we are growing apples and pears, like we don't want the lanternfly over there. So should we keep our, our tree of heaven just to, to know where they're going to be? Uh, and it, it really is an interesting strategy and we'll have to, we'll have to keep an eye on how it's going to work out long-term and, um, you know, really see, see what happens over time and, and see if, if it can be an effective uh, way of managing this, this pest. Any other questions, questions Patty? Yeah. I don't see any other questions. I wanted to add that I will add the link to the New Jersey Department of Agriculture the, uh, to where one can report sightings. I'll add it to the Wayne Public Library's Facebook um, feed as well as our Instagram. And I'll uh, ask also if we could post it actually to our website and direct also information to both of your departments. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining me today here and uh, bringing this very important information we're going to continue to try to have information available here at the library. And again, any questions, um, we'll make sure that the right person can answer it for you. So thank you very much for taking the time today and, and for educating us. And, and we'll do our best to, to stomp it out. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so for having me. And uh, yeah, please don't be shy. Please contact our office or me personally if you have questions. Uh, we'd love to to be a resource for you. Thanks so much, Amy, and thank you, Patty. Thank you, ladies. Have a good afternoon.
You also. Thank you. Bye-bye.